Today I am going to show you three stoic ways to deal with regret. But what is regret? Seneca said, to get rid of two things for good, the fear of future suffering and the memory of past suffering. The latter doesn't bother me anymore and the former doesn't bother me yet. You finally get home after a long day at work and bad traffic. You're tired, bored and angry about the day's events all at the same time because of the stress. There are a lot of dishes in the kitchen when you get there. You asked your partner to do them this morning. Still, they're just chilling out in front of the TV like nothing is wrong. You can feel your anger building and you lose it and yell at your partner. You're not shy. You want to show that what happened is very important. Your partner is scared and feels bad about themselves. They're scared because you've never yelled at them this way before. The plan was for them to do the dishes later, but you never let them. They've had a long day too, but you didn't care. They only wanted a good time with you that night, but now that's over. Later that night, you finally understand what it cost you to lose your cool. You know what you said was wrong. You ought to have been more kind. You were wrong to do what you did. You feel bad about your decisions. It could have been something else that made you angry. It could have been your kids drawing on the wall or your boss giving you that report right before you go on vacation. It doesn't matter what the situation was. We've all lost it and felt the pang of remorse. The Stoics said that regret is when things that happened in the past take over our lives now. When we think too much about things we can't change. When we fight against our fate. Marcus Aurelius said that we should be satisfied with what we have and accept the present, all of it. Regret is when we don't accept what we've been given and aren't happy with what we have. It was Seneca who said, we often suffer more in imagination than in reality. What he meant was that sorrow is just a feeling we make up in our minds. We think that things would have turned out differently if we had said or done something different. Marcus Aurelius thought the same way and came up with a way to solve this problem. Things outside are not the trouble. This is how you rate them, that you can delete now. Let's look at that fight you had with your partner again. Your regrets aren't about the food or your partner. They're about how you thought things should have gone. When you got home, you thought your partner would already have done the dishes. You think things would have been better for you if they had been different. Does that mean your partner is to blame? For example, for leaving the dishes in the sink, but definitely not for overreacting and most certainly not for the guilt you felt that night. Regret is an emotional issue that must be identified and resolved by the individual. It's important to get over these self-focused emotions and learn to control our regrets. This post is meant to help you understand how you feel, learn from your mistakes and get over your biggest regrets. What causes my regret? Those who forget the past, ignore the present and fear the future will have a short and happy life said Seneca. There are a lot of jokes, motivational words and movies online that remind us to tell ourselves no regrets. It has been the subject of art by poets, singers, painters and artists for thousands of years. It's pretty much become the way we live by. We all have something we wish we hadn't done, no matter how many times we read about it, sing a song about it or tell ourselves not to. We all have that feeling that keeps coming back. We thought we had forgotten about that time, place and people until that hit us. It always comes back at the worst time. It's awful. It's painful. It's important not to underestimate the power of sorrow. Daniel Pink, the best-selling author and founder of the American Regret Project, found that 82% of Americans feel regret at least once in a while. It's an indispensable emotion, according to Pink, but it can also be a positive instrument for improving your life. We can't run away from these bad feelings if we want to make our lives better. They can't be hidden, but should we just give up and be sad? Should we just accept that we will always feel bad about what we did? Near the end of 1775, 
The great author Samuel Johnson must have been thinking about this. With 1776 coming up, Johnson wrote in his diary, When I think about all the resolutions I've made to make things better and different that I have broken year after year, either because I forgot to keep them, or because I was too busy or sick to do anything, I ask myself why I bother to make them again. So much of my life has been wasted, and I can only remember a few days that I was properly and vigorously employed. I try because I believe in change, and that giving up is wrong. Johnson accepted what happened in the past, but not what he felt bad about. It was his choice to think about his problems in order to get better and not make the same mistakes again. He chose to fight his sorrow instead of giving in to it. One thing we can learn from Johnson is that we will always feel sorrow, but our deeds and attitudes don't have to be. So, the question is not, why do I feel bad about? How do I deal with it? How do I get past this? How can this make me better? To answer these questions, the Stoics use the following techniques to make their minds stronger and more resilient. First, they looked at what they could control. Pay attention to what you can control. It's like every event has two handles, one that can hold it and one that can't. If your brother hurts you, don't grab it by its wrongdoing, because that's the handle that can't lift it. Instead, use the other one, that he is your brother and that you grew up together, and then you will have the handle that holds. Epictetus presented the Stoic theory. One of the most important things we can do is figure out what we can control and what we can't, what we can change and what we can't, what we can and can't change. Pictet said that we can look at the past in two different ways, or grab two handles. The first handle pushes us to see the past as something that was bound to go wrong and hurt us from the start. On the other hand, the opposite handle lets us take out the good parts and use our events to make ourselves better. When we look at choices we've made in the past, we need to take them by the last handle. We need to understand that what took place did take place. It doesn't matter how badly the past hurt us or other people, we can't change it. What good does it do to feel bad? Everything, as author and Holocaust survivor Dr. Edith Eager put it, one sentence, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done things differently. That was it, she said. The past is the only thing you can't change, so don't feel guilty about what happened. People have lost faith in the idea that they can control everything. No matter what happens, we all think we have some say in how things turn out. We all think that we can change what happened if we keep thinking about it. We have to accept that some things are fixed and cannot be changed. We need to know that we can't always control what happens. You are in charge if you feel bad about getting a haircut. It's up to you whether you want to style it, cover it, or just wait for it to come back. You can't take back the bad words you said to your boss before leaving though. You're not in charge. As Marcus Aurelius wrote to himself, and for that matter to us. Remind yourself that the past and the future don't control you. Only the present, and even that can be shrunk down. Just draw lines around its edges. And if your mind says it can't stand up to that, then shame on it. The past is over. We can't stay stuck in our fears. Regrets are something we can't think about. Now that what happened is over, we need to learn how to let go. Coach Phil Jackson, who was always calm, said, Letting go is a necessary, if sometimes heart-wrenching, gateway to real transformation. They named it the art of acquiescence, letting go of what things are and agreeing with them so they can become what they are meant to be. Being regretful means that we wish things had gone the way we had planned. But if we let things happen as they should, we're less likely to feel bad about what we did. When we realize that we can't change some things, we are less likely to wish for a better result. We no longer have power over the past. What we said, did, and how we felt can't be changed. We can, however, do something about the moment. 
we decide how to grow from our mistakes. We have power over how we deal with problems. We decide how to make the most of our regrets. Right now, we decide what to do. We need to. Feel love for your fate. For Marcus Aurelius, a blazing fire makes flame and brightness out of everything that is thrown into it. Finding out what we can control is the first step. The next step is to decide how to react, whether we can control what is happening or not. We need to figure out how to deal with ourselves. We need to figure out how to get around problems. We need to figure out what to do next. Epictetus imagines that he is being killed by Roman guards in the first book of his discourses. He has no power over his life. In an act of peace and intelligence, he writes down his ideas. I have to die. But do I have to die crying? It's necessary to chain me up, but also to moan and groan. I have to be sent away, but is there anything that can stop me from going with a smile, calm and steady? The German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche came up with the phrase Amor Fati, which means loving your fate. Epictetus and the Stoics were the first people to use it. The Stoics often used this practice to deal with past pain and find inner peace through meditation and deep thought. Cleaning the said, the fates help those who accept them and hurt those who resist them. To have Amor Fati, you have to do more than just understand what happens to you. It means realizing that the way we see things doesn't always have to be bad. It's realizing that being okay with the way things are will make us better. That we should be thankful for dark days sometimes and know that there is always a way to get through them. We all have hard times. Everything gets backed up. When we need to send an important message, we all have to deal with slow Wi-Fi or bad cell service. As smart people, we often believe that these problems were purposely created for us, that everyone is out to get us, we are not able to win. This is not at all true. There are problems that everyone faces. Everybody trips up sometimes. Some things in life are out of our control, as we talked about in the first part. We will never be able to stop these problems, no matter how hard we try. When we accept what happens to us and realize that we can't change some things, especially bad things, we are left with loving whatever happens to us and meeting it with strength and happiness every time. To quote best-selling author Robert Greene, we need to accept the fact that all events occur for a reason and that it is within your capacity to see this reason as positive. In meditations, Marcus Aurelius uses the picture of an artist's shop to perfectly show this idea. Be careful, there are thorns on the way. That's enough to say. Why think about the presence of nuisance? People who really study nature would find this kind of thinking funny, like how a baker or a carpenter would laugh if you pointed out the sawdust and chips on their floors but those store owners need trash cans for their trash, but nature doesn't. Why let the thorns get in your way? There is dirt on the floor, so why think about it? It's just how things are in nature. You can get past them as long as you can see them. We're also less likely to feel bad about our choices in the future when we use Amor Fati. By being open to the problems we face, we're less likely to regret the choices we make to overcome them, no matter what happens. We can face the future with faith, courage, trust, and many other things. Love is more than a state of mind. It's a way of life. It will take time, work, and sacrifices that you probably won't enjoy to make Amor Fati a part of your life. But we have to. We need to get over this psychological angst we need to get over our regrets and look to the future. Love what's going on with you. Love how much you've changed and who you've become. Love your fate or Amor Fati. Go ahead. At every turn, we should project our thoughts ahead of us and think about every possible outcome instead of just the way things usually go. Seneca. Think about all the bad things that could happen before you do something important. 
figure out how to solve problems before they happen by seeing them coming before they happen. By being ready, you can keep yourself from being stressed if something goes wrong. Seneca told them, rehearse them in your mind, hunger, torture, war, and shipwreck. All the rules of our lives as people should be right in front of us. One of the oldest and most popular techniques in Stoic thought is this one, which is called premeditatio malorum. It literally means planning for bad things to happen. The Stoics did this to help them get ready for the bad things that were going to happen in life and stay calm and sure of themselves when things went wrong. The world is not fair. Everyone knows this. Sometimes we don't get what we deserve, even if we've worked hard for it. We play hard, but we don't always win. We shouldn't be shocked if we don't win, though. If something surprising always surprises you, you'll not only be unhappy when you try something big, it will be much harder to accept it and move on to attempts two, three, and four. It will be very hard for you to stay in the present and not dwell on the past. You will have a harder time pushing through sorrow and following your gut. The great Booker T. Washington may be the best example of premeditatio malorum in a person. Washington was in charge of a school with 1,500 kids, gave advice to leaders and organizers, and gave talks all over the country. How, though? How was he able to keep up this living and be so successful? I expect a successful and pleasant day at work in the morning, but I'm also ready to hear that one of our school buildings is on fire or has burned down, that something bad has happened, or that someone has slandered me in a public address or a newspaper article for something I did or didn't do, or for something he heard me say, probably something I hadn't thought of saying. He thought about the worst things that could happen to him during the day. He not only thought about them, but he also thought they would happen. By doing this, Washington was better ready for the hard times that were coming. A train that didn't come could not be worse than his school catching on fire. Being late for dinner couldn't be worse than being sworn at in public. Washington was getting ready for difficulties, but he was also getting ready for sorrow. Because he could see and expect his fears to come true, he was less afraid of how his decisions would turn out and less likely to regret them. In the same way, Epictetus used this to help him see all the risks that came with what seemed like a simple choice, bathing. If you're going to take a bath, picture the usual things that happen in the bath, people pouring out, people pushing in, people scolding, people stealing. If something comes up that makes bathing impossible, you can say, it wasn't just to bathe that I wanted. I also wanted to keep my will in harmony with nature, and I won't do that if things make me laugh. By practicing premeditatio malorum, we can be better ready for the bad things that will happen in life. It may be hard to accept, but things will not go our way. We might not get the job we want. That game might not be ours to lose, but we'll be ready for anything that comes our way. We'll know that the choice we made was the right one, and we won't feel bad about it.